it seems in recent months, there has been almost an unprecedented level of support for Taiwan in Japan. Uh, you know, high ranking politicians talking about we have to defend Taiwan, encouraging the global community to defend Taiwan, um, establishing missile defense systems on some of Japan's lower islands, really, like right next to Taiwan. But so you're saying there is still an element in Japanese political society that uh, is not going in that direction. Uh, that's correct, unfortunately. So uh, the more outspoken politicians tend to be on the the more conservative side of the conservative party. Uh, and many of them um, either have a connection with the, uh, having served in the uh, the post-war military called the Japan Self-Defense Forces. Uh, one example would be uh, Mr. Sato Masahisa, or the recent statement by the uh, former Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Aso Taro, or the statement by the uh, Vice Defense Minister, Mr. Nakayama Yasuhide. Those three uh, are in particular in particular, outspoken on the Taiwan issue. The latter two, Mr. Aso and Mr. Nakayama, have um, long historical ties with Taiwan uh, from their, you know, from their uh, father's generation. And so they've always had a very uh, affection, affinity for Taiwan. Um, many people have sympathy with that view, but as a politician, for whatever reason, they may not, may may not be able to uh, you know state things in that way. But um, those statements have had you know, very strong uh, support here in Japan, and specifically, the statements were uh, with regard to Mr. Aso. He talked about a contingency affecting Taiwan has a direct impact on Japan's survival. Um, in American political terms, that would not be a you know an overly bold or strong statement. But in post-war Japan, that's a very uh, clear and bold statement. Uh, Mr. Nakayama, in an interview or a discussion with an organization in in D.C., uh, he talked about Taiwan not only being a friend of Japan but also its family, its brother, and that that's a very clear uh, you know statement uh, to support. Uh, Taiwan. And then Mr. Sato, who was a colonel in the uh, ground self-defense forces, um, from his own, you know, experiences, he has a, uh, you know, clear understanding that the geostrategic importance of Taiwan in the region. And he's called for, among other things, a, um, a Japan version of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, he's also called for what's called a two plus two dialogue with Taiwan. So in other words, the defense ministers and the foreign secretaries to uh, discuss about, uh, you know, Taiwan situation. Uh, he's also called for uh, what's known as the guidelines, which would uh, facilitate U.S.-Japan military um, coordination in a Taiwan Strait contingency. So, um, those kind of statements would have been difficult to imagine a few years ago, but it uh, it shows, as your your question alludes to, that um, they are moving in that direction. What has changed that they're able to make those statements now when they wouldn't have a few years ago? Probably, um, probably three or four things. One is that uh, Taiwan you know, continues to develop as a democracy. You know, when we think of, and particularly when Americans think of Taiwan, particularly older Americans, they may be thinking of the pre, you know, 1996 or pre-1990s Taiwan uh, with the Chiang Kai-shek era or the, you know, the uh, lack of democracy, the dictatorship period. Um, whereas the Taiwan that the younger generation knows is the you know, the democratic Taiwan and the Taiwan in which, um, you know, identity of the people of the island are Taiwanese, not as Chinese. So I think more and more people uh, in Japan recognize that, that Taiwan sees itself as uh, Taiwanese uh, and that is uh, democratic and shares the, you know, the values that uh, 
that Japan has, you know, democracy, uh, human rights, rule of law. Uh, a second aspect has to do with the um, the mutual support that the countries have given to one another during uh, humanitarian crises in the country. Uh, Taiwan was, uh, I believe, the largest donor of aid to Japan after the March 11th uh, earthquake and tsunami that impacted Japan in, in 2011. That really positively affected Japanese people. They were extremely touched by that, and um, and they've wanted to, uh, you know, continue to help Taiwan in a number of ways. Uh, a third thing, obviously, has to do with uh, with China's, uh, you know, aggressive intentions uh, towards the region, uh, and that particularly the um, the growth of its military and the constant pressure. That China puts on Japan's borders, um, as you mentioned earlier about the defense of the southwestern islands in Japan. Uh, from the southernmost island of Yonoguni, you can actually see Taiwan. That's how close it is. And um, more and more uh, Japanese people are understanding, you know, that. And then finally, I think um, events in Hong Kong have really impacted uh, the Japanese public uh, because they see what's happened in Hong Kong. They're afraid it's going to uh, happen to Taiwan. If it happens to Taiwan, Okinawa is next, and then mainland Japan is next. Uh, so uh, more and more people are understanding that connection uh, you know, between uh, you know, peace and prosperity abroad with you know, what happens in their own country. So what does it mean for Japan if China's communist forces take over Taiwan? You said Okinawa is next. How, do, how, how does that work? Um, well, most likely uh, in a Taiwan contingency, uh, China would also be striking at um, either U.S. facilities in, in Japan, of which there are quite a few in Okinawa, uh, or um, taking out uh, Japanese military facilities or civilian facilities that would be able to lend any support to assisting or defending uh, ta Taiwan. So from the very beginning, uh, Japan uh, would most likely be under attack as well. Uh, so uh, on an immediate sense, that's the first thing that would happen. Um, let's say that unfortunately, uh, a Chinese, you know, strike on Taiwan was successful where China actually took over Taiwan. Um, you know, obviously, all of uh, Taiwan's infrastructure, uh, and particularly its industrial uh, capabilities, would then fall to uh, Chinese hands. Um, China would get control, essentially, of the, the key part of the first island chain, uh, and then that would allow China to station forces on Taiwan and then from Taiwan to then move into the not only the Western Pacific, but into the second and third uh, island chains, you know, basically approaching Hawaii. As it moves you know, further eastward towards Hawaii, uh, that means Japan's north and south sea lanes and uh, you know, traffic whether it's military or economic, would be completely disrupted by the, uh, you know, by the, you know, large Chinese forces that are going to be there. Um, I think it also it will affect the image and impressions of the United States that uh, the U.S. was not able to defend Taiwan, and that will cause a shift, I think, in in Japanese opinion uh, to back to uh, maybe cooperating with China. And so there'll be essentially, the U.S. would be pushed out of the region. Uh, Japan would have uh, basically two options, to fight it out on its own or to go along with, with, uh, with China. So, um, and that would be you know, bad for the region and the world. Um, China would also be able to turn its forces on, on the Philippines, acquire its natural resources, um, and then, you know, the rest of Southeast Asia would be, uh, you know, basically made into a, 
you know, Chinese lake. So uh, it would be a very bad situation if that were to happen. And Japan would be one of the countries that would suffer the worst from it. 